Okay, good evening. Assalamualaikum, doctors. Welcome to our third deep session of this MCQ based discussion. So, there we have a list of topics. So, first, let's have a look at this post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Let me take you to MTB. Okay, for this post glomerular streptococcal uh, glomerulonephritis, we actually the 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 common term is post infectious glomerulonephritis, and this is one of the most common infection which we actually see here. That is a streptococcal infection. That's why they changed the name. It turned to post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, but actually the term is post infectious. But most of the time we have seen this is streptococcal infection. That's why we just changed the name. So the most common organism leading to post infectious glomerulonephritis is streptococcus. But almost any infection can lead to abnormal activation of the immune system and can cause this infectious disease. Now, what is there, especially as far as our MCQs are concerned, you have to go, you, you know, you, you must know the presentation of the patient and especially the findings. Findings is very important for solving the MCQs, uh, especially of this topic. So post-estraptococcal glomerulonephritis follows throat infection or skin infection by one to three weeks. So what you have seen that after affecting, especially this glomerulus, this infection is going to invade the whole body. It may go into the throat. It may go, you know, it can, it can manifest the skin also. So most of the time, it's not only up to the kidneys, but we will find this infection spreading and transmitting along the way and can, can involve the skin and can involve the throat as well. So may, we may see after involvement of the glomerulus, Sometimes throat is also involved and sometimes skin infectious will be there. So we can, you know, have a clue that this might be a, uh, this might be this infection, but it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. You should yeah. know the symptoms. Yes, dear. It's the other way around. It's the throat infection and that uh, anglomerulonephritis follows throat infection or skin infection. See, it, it, now, now there are two important things to notice. First of all, whether the presentation is first, we have noticed this protein urea, first we have noticed this tea color, and then the patient is telling you that he, is, he or she is having throat infection. That is one possibility, and that is most of the time the possibility is like this. But what is happening, sometimes there is a streptococcal infection in the throat, and that may also involve and go to the glomerulus. So sometimes we have seen this ascending infection, and sometimes we may see the re retrograde infection, like involving the glomerulus and going up around. So the, both of the presentations are there, but most of the time, the presentation is usually retrograde. What, what we have seen in clinical practice, that first they may pre present with the T-colored or the scope of colored urine, and then later on, they are going to develop this respiratory infection, some uh, you know, after two weeks or three weeks, you may find some skin infections preceded by the proceeding in skin infections. So this is retrograde, but most, but it may also happen in the way that first the skin and throat is involved, and then with after you know two to three weeks, you can see because it's a disseminated infection. So it may be anterograde, it may be retrograde. But most of the time, what I'm saying in clinical practice, we have seen this retrograde infection, but it's the other way around, of course. So here, what you will see, especially for for, some, uh, for the symptoms point of view, what we will see in our patient, the presentation is dark polar colored urine. So very, very clear and obvious symptoms we can see in our patient that the patient will present and will say that the, the, the color of the urine is very dark or it's, sometimes they will say it's a tea colored or coca colored. So once it's written tea colored or coca colored, think about this post infectious edema that is often periorbital. If, if there, there's overall systemic involvement, you can see this periorbital edema, hypertension will be there, the increased BP will be there, and the, the patient may say that they are having this oligoyuria, like they, they are feeling urgency, but once they pass the urine, the quantity is low, the quantity is not that much, you know, uh, sufficient, so they will say that it's oligoyuria, maybe frequency is increased, but the amount of urine every time will be less as compared to the normal one. So this must be the presentation. Now, what you are going to do, you will always go for whenever there is any complaint related to urine, you will always go for the urinalysis. So here also, we will go and do the urinalysis and we will check the amount of protein in the urine because once the color of the urine is changed, you must be thinking that the protein is actually coming out and the RBCs are actually coming out from the urine. Normally, it's the glomerular basement membrane, they will, they will all, you know, they will not allow RBCs or protein to filter. 
from the glomerulus and going into the urine because it's it's a normal glomerulus membrane but once the basement membrane is affected and we will see there's a damage to the basement membrane there are big big holes and pores will be formed inside the basement membrane and these rbcs these proteins which normally won't be able to pass through the glomerular membrane but this time because of the damage of the basement membrane they can easily pass through and come into the urine so what we will see here uh, this is uh, the uh, previous recall recently I, I didn't find anyone but uh, but you may know you should know that uh, the analysis is the first step always always the first step whenever it comes to diagnosing anything in the kidney whenever the patient is presenting with any kind of kidney symptoms always go for urinalysis that's a that's a unique term for best investigation so here we will check protein urea, especially RBCs and red blood cell cars tell you that glomerular nephritis is present. So once the glomerular basement membrane is affected because of any reason, because of infection, maybe because of immunoglobins, maybe because of autoimmune system, anything can be there. You remember we have already done this good pasture and all that. So if any reason where the damage to the basement membrane has occurred, we will see what? glomerular nephritis. So this post streptococcal one is actually caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococci is confirmed first by anti streptolysin titers and anti DNA antibody titer. So what we will have we have this uh, this one uh, if if this streptococcal is actually caused by group A beta hemolytic then only we will go for ASO titer and we can do this anti DNA antibody titers that will come positive biopsy is the most accurate test usually we will never prefer to go for biopsy but again we have this most accurate one but you should not routinely do a kidney biopsy because the blood test is sufficiently accurate and the disorder usually resolves spontaneously so once the infection subsides so of course uh, you know you don't need to do anything so here what is the very important point for our exam point of view you should know that this is because antibodies again are involved here it's okay that's an infection infectious agent is the reason for causing this disease, but there is again some autoimmune problem here, and we may find this there are some complement proteins which are actually low in in this disorder. So complement proteins, these are the proteins which will help in the autoimmune, which will help you know to maintain the whole autoimmune system of our body. So especially there is one protein which is not mentioned here, but please memorize this one that is called C3 complement protein, and this C3 complement protein is usually low in all the autoimmune disorders, including this glomerulonephritis as well so this is also one of the clue in uh, you know a part of this ASO titer a part of this anti-dns uh, antibody titers we will see this complement c3 level proteins deficiency especially in this in these patients low level of complement c3 so that is also one of the clue in making a diagnosis of this post streptococcal glomerulonephritis so complement levels are low in especially in this one so treatment management does not of course reverse the glomerulonephritis. nephritis whatever you do you will just support the patient so say for example if infection inflammation is there you're just going to eradicate the infection but what happened to the glomerular membrane of course has happened already and you cannot change that so once the damage to the glomerular membrane has occurred that damage will be there you will just prevent you know the patient from getting more and more damage and you will just support your patient if she's having or he's having inflammatory symptoms you will you're just going to support that one so you will give antibiotic to cover the infection of course you will give diuretics to control the fluid overload if it's there but you cannot reverse the whole disease because once the damage is there the damage will be there you will just you know st stop the progression of the damage so less than five percent of those with this will will progress you, you cannot stop that one because once the damage has started if autoimmune system is activated and because of the deficiency of the complement system the patient again and again will have you know will, will be going and suffer the same problem and what we will do we will just do and support the support the patient we will just you know support the patient in forms of antibiotics in form of you know decreasing the work overload of the glomerulus by giving the diuretics so we can't do much more here so let's have a look at the questions and we will see how can we solve this one. Now the first question says, a 14 year old boy boy presents to the clinic complaining of brown urine for the past three days. So any term which is mentioned here, brown or tea colored or coca colored, always think about this uh, streptococcal infection. Now for the past three days, two weeks ago, he had two days of fever and sore throat. Now this is the enterograde infection. You can say two weeks ago, Prior having of this problem, he was having fever and sore throat. So this is one of the anterograde uh, presentation, but he improved spontaneously and has been well ever since. Now on physical examination, only periorbital edema is noted. So here 
once you do the examination you can you will only find this peri orbital edema there is no much other finding and of course one of the one of the symptoms which patient has you know to, uh, told you that is the brown colored urine and the the, the the sign which you have noticed in the patient is peri orbital edema now blood pressure again 136 92 for the for the uh, of course for the child this blood pressure is on the little higher side heart rate is okay respiratory rate is uh, respiratory rate is 28 which is slightly higher temperature is okay so so we cannot say that this baby is hypertensive or this child is hypertensive 14 years old child but again the bp is on a higher side he is having this brown colored urine plus he was having this sore throat infection that's the scale, that says uh, uh, pharyngeal uh, pharyngeal involvement and maybe the patient it, it may also mention here some of the skin problem like impetigo as well but it's not mentioned here now on your analysis once the urine analysis is done you have seen the specific gravity which is normal range but you may appreciate protein and blood in the urine so uh, protein also plus plus and blood also plus plus it means they are there in urine analysis it means so, so how you are going to say what is the most likely diagnosis here So, I do you think it's an IgG nephropathy? It's an IgG nephropathy, or is it acute uh, pyelonephritis, hemolytic uremic syndrome, or post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis? See, based on the presentation, is very much clear. But in order to make a diagnosis of IgG nephropathy, it's especially the low levels of IgG, as especially we will see this autoimmune complex. So, for making a diagnosis of IgG, we have to have IgG. Something mentioned in the questions, you know, in order to make your diagnosis of this IgG, you cannot say like that. based on only these findings acute pyelonephritis of course when we say it's less likely in a in children we will won't find this pyelonephritis most likely occur in young adolescent females so it's most not likely you know we will not go for this pyelonephritis although in pyelonephritis we will see some of this um, and you know lower abdominal pain must be there the presentation should start and it has nothing to do with you know with the prior uh, any infectious history and the changes of the color you will not appreciate too much of the protein cast and blood cast in this patient especially those who are having pyelonephritis then hemolytic uremic syndrome this hemolytic uremic syndrome and the thrombocytopenic uh, ttp that is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura both of them should have the history of infection such as e coli and shigella infection so there the patient must be having this watery diarrhea and loose stool and vomiting may be there and anorexia may be there child weight loss history should be there in order to make a diagnosis platelet because of the platelet count low you will find you know some of the uh, especially this bleeding disorder in that patient some bruises over all over the body so there is a very specific features in order to make a diagnosis of hemolytic uremic syndrome so of course this uh, this case is not actually pertaining to make us you know to make a diagnosis so it's a very clear case of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis why based on the presentation brown urine based on the physical examination peri orbital edema based on the anterogate history of fever and sore throat prior to this in, uh, this glomerulonephritis and based on the urine analysis protein and blood blood plus plus you will go and choose post streptococcal glomerulonephritis second question says a 5 year old child has a one day history of cola colored urine so again if it's mentioned cola colored urine tea colored urine or brown urine always you know have uh, this uh, uh, post streptococcal in your mind with red blood cell cast so your analysis shows a uh, short blood red cell cast now two weeks ago the child had a culture positive streptococcal tonsillitis so he had his uh, not pharyngeal involvement tonsillitis was there so history of infection was there preceding a diagnosis that you post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is suspected now we already have a provisional diagnosis you don't need to think about the diagnosis they have already given you a provisional diagnosis of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis now which of following is the best clinical evidence to support the diagnosis now what you are going to do in order to confirm your diagnosis you have provisional diagnosis in your mind that this child is a case of post streptococcal now what else you can do in order to confirm that yes this is a post streptococcal so we have Uh, uh two things especially one we can uh, do this anti dns antibody titer or aso titer or second we should show we should know the complement level status that should be low so we will find something like that so do you think it's a mildly elevated blood creatinine blood creatinine has nothing to do with these type of things negative anti nuclear antibodies antibodies are present in this type of uh, diseases whenever we say autoimmune diseases there are the antibodies which are responsible to you know to destroy our own antigen and creating this antigen antibody complex so negative cannot be you know any any case it should be a positive aso titer if it's there we have to go for that 
positive streptozyme testing there is nothing like that streptozyme testing only we can check the antibodies level or we can check the complement levels so here i have told you just memorize this thing that complement proteins are usually low in this type of disease and we have one particular complement that is c3 so if you have low c3 level or if you have high positive aso type of dns especially anti dns antibodies are there you will confirm the diagnosis of post tractor coca so three things maybe aso titer is positive antibody titer is positive maybe anti dna is uh, antibody is positive and the third thing is complement low level complement that is low c3 these are the three things on the basis of which you will say it's a case of confirm it can you will confirm the diagnosis actually so the answer should be low c3 if aso titer is here go for that if dna is antibody is titer is there a positive dna is antibody go for that or low c3 these are the three points here next question says a 9 year old uh, a 9 year old girl is brought to the emergency department with abnormal movements and a recent history of tea colored urine now you have seen all the presentation brown urine coca colored urine and the tea tea you colored during her parents describing a preceding skin eruption now she she was having this anterograde skin eruption so skin involvement was there in before that you were having tonsillitis the patient was having cap tonsillitis before before the first one was having uh, pharyngitis so you have seen all the preceding infection of pharyngitis tonsillitis and maybe the skin problem like here she is presenting with a skin eruption on examination the child looks unwell unresponsive and lower limb swelling is noted now the swelling is there but you have seen the swelling in lower limb is actually involving and the child looks unwell unresponsive on examination blood pressure is quite high you can see you can appreciate it's 155 105 heart rate is on the high side respiratory rate is in increased temperature is okay test results shows hemoglobin 78 now she is having low hemoglobin if you can see here 78 of course the hemoglobin count is low platelet count 165 so platelet is okay so platelet count is normal blood urea nitrogen 13.1 which is okay creatinine is 101 which is uh, uh, slightly on the higher side but complement you can see here the level of the complement is low so it should, the normal range should be 0.7 to 1.5 she is having 0.5 so low level complement level plus the presentation so now they are asking you what is the most likely diagnosis so tea colored urine skin eruption uh, prior history is there although she is anemic of course she is losing her her rbcs especially uh, must must be in urine so that's why the hemoglobin count is low but platelet is okay so once the platelets are okay then you will not think about any of the other disorder blood urea nitrogen creatinine is slightly on the higher side this can confuse you but but please don't because once the complements are involved there will be much more damage and because of the much more damage creatinine or can also go higher so uh, that is one of the you know one of the campaigning thing but most of the time creatinine level usually don't go higher but as this baby this child is having too much blood pressure there are chances uh if, if there is more damage to the glomerular basement membrane you may find high crack level also so complement levels are low so once the complements levels are low based on the presentation plus complement levels are low this will help you in making the diagnosis of post tractor coccal glomerulonephritis so which of the following is the most likely do you think it's a post tractor coccal do you think it's a hemolytic uremic syndrome of course not because in hemolytic uremic syndrome you will always find low platelets there must be thrombocytopenia here the platelet count is up almost normal it's 165 so it lies under the normal category Hinoxian lung perfusion. There is no presentation of the, of such thing like that because again, in Hinoxian lung perfusion, there will be low platelet. There will be bruises all over the body. There is nothing like that, and presentation also is not the same. The baby is only having you know this lower limb swelling, and the baby is having this tea colored urine. So that is not going to go for this diagnosis. Acute renal failure. For acute renal failure, crack should be very much on higher side. But, and you will see this protein of course this plus 4 and plus 5 protein so again and there you will not find complement c3 there must be infection infectious history can be there of course but for acute renal failure there will be more uh, you know in, in this uh, th there will be much more you know drastic change and the patient must be you know in very confused altered mental state so of course this is not going to comply with the this one so here your most likely diagnosis based on the complement low level protein and based on the presentation of the beard of the child you will go for post tractor coccal glomerular fractures okay so i think these questions are quite uh, quite clear based on the symptoms and based on the presentation and based on the finding which you are going to observe especially in during your analysis and by checking the complement levels so let's go to the next one 
And next we have Oscar uh, Schlatter's disease. So for this, we'll go for the theory first. Yes. Okay. It's pretty hard. Thank you, Shami. Okay, here. So, or especially this Oscar Schlatter uh, disease, we are going to cover in this pediatric section. Why? Because most of the time they are, uh, you know, most of the time the the children who are having ages in between ten to fourteen years of age, especially if you are considering girls, they have mentioned ten to eleven years. If you are considering boys, thirteen to fourteen years. So these these are the adolescent ch ch children. So most of the time we have seen uh, the, uh, this disease in these patients. And what is happening here? It's a disease of anterior knee pain. They're having this tibial tuberosity pain, especially they're going to point towards the tibial tuberosity. That's the most prominent part of the knee joint. And often bilateral, most of the time, they are complaining both sides around 25 to 50% of cases of tibial tuberosities who are athletic and undergoing a growth spurt. So of course, this is a high time when the growth spurt is there. And uh, and when whenever they are doing that, they are highly you know uh, into running and jumping and uh, you know doing exercises at this point of time in adolescent age. So they must be having this anterior pain. So if they are presenting with this anterior pain, which is going to worse during jumping or running or swimming, so we can think about this uh, Oscar disease. And what is the main thing here? It is caused by repetitive stress from the quadricep tendons pulling on the tibial tuberosity. So see, this is caused by repetitive stress because of the stress because of the jumping or running, running or heavy exercises, the this quadricep tendon, this quadricep tendon, you remember these three vasti and the rectus femoris, they make the uh, muscles of this, all quadricep muscles of the thigh, and they are going to merge and form uh, attached through one single tendon over the tibial tuberosity. So because of the because of the continuous stress, what will happen? There will be a clear bony prominence over the tibial tuberosity. And that tibial prominence, what you're going to see, you will see that there, one minute. It's okay, Fafe. Okay. So, because uh, we will see here in these children, especially there, there is soft tissue swelling over the tibia, over the tibia, over the, around the knee joint. You can easily, you know, appreciate the swelling. But it's not only about swelling. You will see some bony prominences also over the tibial tuberosity because of this high and repeated stress. So that's why we will say that it's okay with the passage of time when you restrict your movement, the swelling will go. And also the bony prominence, which is there, which is very much prominent over the tibial tuberosity, that bony prominence also will get ossified. It will take some time to, you know, for the ossification of this bony prominence. And approximately it will take 18 months, but sometime it can go up to 24 months. So two years years can be there in order to you know just uh, get rid of this problem so what we will advise to our patient who are having this type of problem that they should reduce their physical movement physical activity and we can provide them braces which they can easily apply over the knee joint and that will help and support the tendon because if they keep on repeating the stress again and again what will happen they will be more and more damaged to the soft tissue once the soft tissue is damaged it's okay but once the bony prominence is going to you know you are you're going to see the changes in the bone especially over the tibial tuberosity what will happen the more the damage to the especially uh, the cells of the bone the, those are called osteophytes the the more time they will take you know for this ossification to to get over so it's very important and you, we should know that once the bony prominence is involved like bones are involved osteophytes are involved it will take at least 18 months 24 months to heal so that's why we will ask our you know uh, these children especially to minimize their, uh, especially these all these activities, athletic activities, they, they need to cut down. So how we are going to diagnose these uh, these children? Clinically, pain with palpation over tibial tuberosity. Of course, when you just palpate the tibia, tibial tuberosity, knee, knee joint, when you are going to palpate, especially the tibial prominence area, you will see the, uh, the, the child is going to experience a pain and reproduce with resistant knee extension. Now, imaging, of course, is not needed because it's a very clear-cut clinical diagnosis, but lateral plane films most commonly show soft tissue swelling. So you are definitely, because of the repetitive stress, tissue swelling will be there and may reveal avulsion fracture. Now, what happened once the bony prominence fragmentation is involved, it will take time for ossification. So that's my main point. Please memorize this one, that it's okay. Once soft tissue is involved, we can just restrict the movement and we can get over it. But once the bony prominence ossification is involved, it will take years, at least two years. 
Now, these can be used to rule out more insidious pathology like tumor osteomyelitis. So, on the basis of X-ray, especially this lateral film, we can see whether osteomyelitis is there or any tumor is there or it's just really, uh, you know, the soft tissue swelling, which is mainly because of the stress or repetitive heavy stoneness exercises, because of the repeated heavy stoneness exercises. So what we are going to do, we will just go for the conservative management. We will just go for the symptomatic relief. If pain is there, advise the painkiller. Most likely we'll give NSAIDs and patellar strap to distribute force around insertion of patellar tendon. So see, it's mentioned here, symptoms resolve when bones completely ossify. If, if the tibial prominence bony projection is there, which is involved over the tibial tuberosity, it will take up to 18 months or sometimes may take up to 24 months, like almost two years to get ossified. So the, meanwhile, we will just advise to cut down their all sternus exercises. So let's have a look at the questions. Here it says a 12-year-old boy, look at the age of the patient, is brought to the primary healthcare clinic with knee pain for the past three weeks. So knee pain is there, 12-year-old boy. The pain increases when he runs, jumps, and climbs stairs. So see, running and jumping is associated with this running and jumping. He plays basketball and football at school. So he's an athletic and has no history of injury or trauma. Of course, there will not be any history of trauma and injury, but because of repeating stress again and again, uh, he must have this problem. Physical examination is normal except for the mild edema over the tibial tuberosity. So soft tissue swelling is appreciable. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So of course, at this point of time, he's an athletic, he's having knee pain, not associated with any trauma and something. And all, uh, on examination, you will find this uh, swelling, uh, soft tissue involvement, so what should be your septic arthritis? Of course, you will not go for septic arthritis. Right? Septic arthritis, there should be some infection, inflammation. It's okay, tissue swelling is there, but it should be associated with fever. The joint you will see by yourself that it's a red, hot, tender joint. It's not like that, right? The presentation. And based on the arthrosynthesis, we can only say it's a septic arthritis. Patellar dislocation, if patella, patella, you can easily, you know, uh, on examination, you can easily find out. So if there is any patellar dislocation, there should be something in the examination, which I've mentioned here, that patella is dislocated. But of course, on examination, only soft tissue swelling is there. So you cannot say it's patellar dislocation. Iliotibial band friction syndrome, iliotibial, that's the iliotibial band uh, friction syndrome in which actually this iliac muscle and uh, uh, the muscle which is actually the tibialis anterior muscle that is involved here. But here it's all about quadriceps. Here three vasti, vasti medialis, intermedialis, lacralis plus rachis femoris is involved and they are going to form one tendon and that tendon is going to attach on the tibial depositor. It has nothing to do with the iliotibial. So this is a clear case of Oxford Schlatter disease. Based on the age of the baby, based on the athletic activity, based on the physical examination. So the next one, we have to go for the theory first. Next, we have amoebiasis. It's not very much in detail in MTB. So I will take you to Ambos. Okay. So amoebiasis, of course, is caused by amoeba, which is one of the protozoa. And uh, the name is Antamoeba histolytica. So what is the presentation? Presentation is important for us. It will be, we will see some intestinal manifestation of this protozoal infection and some extra intestinal uh, manifestation. So if you are considering over the intestinal, we will see the, the child or the, the person who's having this amoeba infection must be presenting with loose tools with mucus and bright red blood. So it's not only about the uh, diarrhea, it's about which kind of diarrhea he is or she is going to present. So she must be having bloody or mucus diarrhea. So whenever mucus is there associated with bright red blood, think about this one. And painful defecation, tenesmus is there. Tenesmus is what? Tenesmus is a feeling, is an urge when the person is trying to defecate and he's always having a feeling that, that the rectum is full. But once he keeps on actually, you know, defecating, he will not be able to do that. So that is tenesmus. So that definition is... Uh, distressing and persistent but ineffectual urge to empty the rectum or bladder. He continuously going to do the thing again and again, but he's not able to do that. He's having a feeling of that, that he wants to defecate actually. Abdominal pain is there, cramping is there, sometimes associated with weight loss and anorexia, loss of appetite. So if the patient is complaining something like this one, like painful defecation, abdominal pain, cramps, plus the, uh, the, the loose tools, loose tools having mucus and bright, bright red, 
black. So think about this one. Fever in 10 to 30% of cases and possible systemic symptoms like fatigue, malaise will be there. Fever may or may not be associated. High risk of recurrence, for example, th uh, through self-inoculation, hand to mouth. So of course, it's protozoal infection, most likely the, the root of entry is mouth. So it must be, you know, improper hand washing of the hand that can again lead to uh, this one. So it's a high recurrence. It may, if, if the one who is having the habit of, you know, not washing the hands properly, especially after performing this defecation, they are usually prone to get this infection as well. Chronic form is also possible, which is clinically similar to inflammatory bowel disease. The presentation will be like that. But most of the time, based on the presentation, we can say that. Now, always consider me BSS when a patient present with persistent diarrhea after traveling to a tropical or subtropical tropical destination most of the time their they, their personal hygiene is actually not very good when they are when they're traveling especially these areas tropical and subtropical areas and the patient having a history of this traveling history plus the patient is throwing you with the persistent diarrhea then we can always think about amoebiasis now what are the other things extra intestinal manifestation of this amoebiasis sometimes the fever can be there uh, uh, and sometimes in 95% of cases, amoebic liver abscess is there, usually a solitary abscess in the right row. So this is one of the extra channels. So in case of complication, if some question is saying something like that, that what would be the possible complication of amoebiasis, then, then we will always think about this amoebic liver abscess that the patient can present. And how the patient is going to present if she is or he is having this amoebic liver abscess? Fever must be there, right upper quadrant pain will be there, of course, chest pain will be there, diarrhea, only a third of all cases of amoebic liver abscess, they can precede only a third. So diarrhea, of course, will be the first presentation, and then you will see fever, right upper quadrant pain, chest pain, then you can think about, okay, this is the complication of, uh, extra intestinal complication of amoebiasis. So how we are going to diagnose these patients, those who are having this amoebiasis, of course, we will go for the stool culture, Stool culture we will do, we will do, do the stool detail report, stool DR and culture. And of course, on uh, performing this culture, we will see cyst or trophozyte and fresh stool. Trophozyte often, uh, you know, contain ingested erythrocytes, cysts contain up to four nuclei. So based on the cyst or trophozyte of this protozoal infection, we can easily say it's a, uh, during the stool analysis, we can easily diagnose. Now, confirmatory test. We can have this, uh, especially this ELISA testing, PCR testing, but we usually don't perform this PCR and ELISA testing because it's quite obvious on stool analysis. Colonoscopy can be performed with biopsy, flask shape also we can see in the later stages, but again is that we will never go for the col uh, this colonoscopy, but if we have this last resort in our hand, you can see this flask shape ulcers can be the finding, but we, we will not go for that. We will only uh, up, remain up to stool analysis and we will start the treatment and soon the patient resolves, symptoms resolves. Now what happened if there's extra intestinal amoebiasis? So we'll go for this antibody detection sometime because antibody and uh, of course autoimmune problems can occur. So we will check for the antibody, we'll check for the uh, abscess, what kind of fluid is there in the abscess, we will take the axillary, we'll go for the analysis of that one. And uh, this they will say that shows uh, brown fluid and pus, exudate resemble and Kobe paste, like just like the presentation of the paste they are saying. So whatever the fluid they are going to drain from this abscess, they will they will uh, you know send it for his uh, this culture and sensitivity, and based on the result, they can start the detection. In amoebic hepatic abscess, liver function test, of course, will be on slightly higher side. You will see deranged LFT because liver is involved. So, of course, LFTs will be deranged. When you do the imaging techniques, you can see ultrasound. There will be hypopoietic area, CT MRI you can perform. But, of course, you, are, will not, you will not get anything because abscess is quite obvious on ultrasound as well. So, no need to go for CT, no need to go for uh, MRI. But, of course, we have this thing just in order to see whether it's an like abscess or not. And what is there? We will just drain the abscess and we'll go will send the fluid for the pathology. Of course, medical therapy, no treatment in endemic areas. Uh, in uh, non-endemic areas, luminal agents such as paramomycin, we can give this uh, idoquinonol, we can give, give this diloxinide. So these are the agents which you can give, you know, as a precaution also, prophylaxis also. Like those who, who are, you know, having a, uh, those who will give you a history that they are going to travel in tropical areas or subtropical areas. So before that, you know, before traveling to these areas, if they come to you for, for advice or something, then we can counsel them to take these medications or at least have 
have them if if they are going to you know have this problem if they are going to uh, present it. the idea later on so they should you know start this medication as a prophylaxis or maybe they can use it during the time period when they are there the goal to prevent the development of invasive disease and the shedding of cysts so we have especially for this one medical therapy now if the symptoms are there symptoms initial treatment we can give this nitrimidazole derivative such as metronidazole gram negative cover you can give to these invasive trophozoite followed by luminal agent paramomycin so for initial you will give metronidazole gram negative cover and then we will give this again luminal agent but most of the time luminal agent we are using as a prophylaxis now there are certain invasive procedures of course if the abscess is there so we'll go for the aspiration so aspiration you can do with the help of ultrasound guided technique also with the help of ct guided technique also so both of the things you have so we will see where actually the abscess is there maybe in the most of the time it's in the left lobe but again it's not mandatory it can be in, in, in any of the lobe of the liver pyogenic abscess it, it's involves the pus so there are multiple abscesses so whatever is there we have to surgically drain it so that's the only treatment or sometime during the drainage this this fluid can also again go here and there and again cause some other complications say for example it can also cause peritonitis as well so that is again one of the complication of this abscess so that is a complication of abscess so cases cause the complication abscess and abscess can cause a complication of peritonitis So how we can prevent all these amebiasis thing? We can just ask the patient, you know, to maintain his oral hygiene, maintain of course his personal hygiene, food and water hygiene uh, should be there. Unpeeled foods or vegetables. So that was a very common report. I didn't see in the last year, but there was a, a you know very common thing. They usually ask that what you will advise for the travelers or those who are going to have travelers diarrhea. We will always advise them to go for the boiled water. We will always advise to go for them the things which they can easily peel off. during the traveling and can eat so for example banana is very safe because banana they are going to peel it and they are going to eat it so whatever is coming from the inside is totally pure and safe don't have anything but the things which are you know uh, those who are, they things like processed food and everything so they have more chance for getting contaminated so avoid all these things so boil water use of the, uh, especially these uh, fruits which have covers so you can just remove them and eat them so it's 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 a general advice for these patients even chlorinated water can contain high concentration of amoeba therefore water should be boiled before use so these are normally this time so the main principle of amoebiasis is prevention consent consumption of potentially contaminated food and water and it can be summarized like boil it cook it peel it or forget it don't use it especially also use only those things which you can easily peel it off and eat it so let's have a look at the question the question is asking a 15 year old child presents to outpatient clinic suffering from abdominal pain diarrhea abdominal pain diarrhea is there tenesmus is there for the last two weeks so she is 15 years old she is having abdominal pain diarrhea is there tenesmus is there there is mucus and blood present in this too so remember mucus and blood presentation in the diarrhea usually pointing towards especially this one associated with tenesmus amebiasis which of the following is the most likely diagnosis now do you think it's amebiasis do you think it's a tenia saginata infection or intestinal ascariasis or bile salt deficiency see uh, in order to say bile salt deficiency you have to have lfps in your hand you cannot say something like that and based on this one we have something of a quadrant pain a presentation should be like that here it's nothing like that so you can never say bile salt deficiency and there will be steatorrhea steatorrhea is one of the very common presentation in case of bile salt deficiency because emulsification is not there and the fatty you will find the stools are very fatty or having this especially uh, lipid lipid droplets in the stool but that is that is of course very obvious on the presentation which is not here intestinal ascariasis ascariasis is one of the steatorrhal infection so here they usually say that they are having this worms inside the, once they pass the stool they will they will tell you that there is a history of passage of worms as well especially if the patient is having ascariasis so again this is not in the history so we cannot choose this one for tenia saginata most of the time the presentation is like this one the patient must be using the food which is not properly cooked there must be a history where it mentioned that the patient is uh, using you know having a food she uh, she loves to eat outside or something like that uh, and this uh, especially you know those are steak lovers and they they are usually not eating this well done steak well done means properly cooked steak so in those patients we may have find this atenia saginata infection and very obvious presentation is anemia 
in these patients. But it's still here again on the presentation of this question, it's nothing like that. So here it's a clear case where it's saying the patient is having this, uh, this uh, mucus and bloody stool plus abdominal pain, nothing else is mentioned here. So of course we'll go for amoebiasis. What it, it should be great if they could mention here, you know, where the patient belongs to. Maybe if there's a recall, it's not mentioned here. Maybe something is mentioned here that this girl has been to an area, you know, subtropical area, or maybe it's belonging to endemic areas. Then of course it's very, very, you know, helpful aid in diagnosis, exactly in the ASS. Excuse me, okay. Dr. Yes, dear. Can you please repeat this bile salt deficiency? Bile salts, see, bile salts are the important factors. They are actually released from the liver and they are responsible for emulsification. Emulsification means that, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this fat, fat can be converted into small droplets. So there must be a metabolism of fats by which fats and lipids can be converted into small droplets so that lipase can easily act on them and they can convert the fat into fatty acids, right? That's the whole digestive process. Now, what if, if there is no bile salt, if there is no bile, for, uh, bile salt, then emulsification will not be there. Emulsification means breaking down of fats or breaking down of lipids into small droplets so that lipase can act on it easily and convert that fat or lipid into fatty acids. And those fatty acids will definitely will absorb in the blood and will go into, into your body. Now, if there, is, if there is deficiency of bile salt, emulsification will not be there. So lipid can easily pass through the stool in the solid form. You will see the big, big uh, portion of the stool, which is, which is showing the stetoria, like lipid droplets, lipid, lipid big mole molecules will be there on the stool. And the stool is, will be very greasy, very oily. It should not be having mucus or blood. If, if the, the, the stool will show something oily, oily stool. Are you getting me? That's a studoria or oily stool. So there will be a big, big patches where the where the total lipid can be can be seen as a whole molecule, not droplet. The whole molecule will be there because emulsification was not there. So that is the presentation, especially the presentation in case of bile salt. So in the history, in the question, there should not be mucus or bloody diarrhea. There should be fatty, oily, greasy stool. So if it's mentioned fatty, oily, greasy stool, then we can only think about bile salt. If they're saying only watery diarrhea or mucus diarrhea or bloody diarrhea, it will not give you a clue that, stu uh, that the stools are having, you know, oils or fats or lipid droplets inside, right? That, that is mainly because of the bile salt deficiency. So think about whenever it says the, the stool, greasy, oily, fatty stool, Stetoria. Stetoria is the name for the fatty stool. Then we can say, okay, we will think about this bile salt deficiency. In this case, the presentation is only bloody and mucus diarrhea. So that is not, of course, the oily and greasy stool. You got it? Got my point? Yes, Dr. Hira. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. So for the next one, we'll go for the theory first. Amidiates is done. Then we have herpangina. Again, herpangina is not there in MTB. So let me take you to Ambers. Herpangina is here. So herpangina is caused by one of the virus, and that is Coxsackie A virus. We will see what are the actually symptoms of this one. Herpes like oral lesion. See, please, please, please don't confuse this herpangina with the herpes infection. It's totally different from that, even the organism is different. about that. So we will not confuse this. Uh, we will not confuse this herpangina with the herpes infection. The lesion is almost like the same. Like you will see this herpes like oral lesion, but the but the positive agent is totally changed. The positive agent is Coxsackie A virus. And the lesion you will find mostly in the posterior oropharynx and tonsils and pharyngeal involvement will be there. Fibrin covered ulceration appears in the later stages. So initially only the ulcers or vesicles and later on it will be converted into ulcer. Sore throat and high grade fever, of course, will be the presentation and more may occur as a component of hand, foot and mouth diseases. So that is again one of the separate disease. But this patient who are having this hand, foot, mouth disease can also present with herpangina. So for herpangina, just, just think about the patient who is having multiple vesicles 
inside you know once you open his or her mouth you will you can appreciate on the posterior wall of the pharynx there will be multiple multiple ulcer, uh, multiple vesicles let me show you one of the diagram see this is her pangina can you see that properly this is a normal normal pharynx you can see but here you can see multiple these multiple small 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 vesicles so these multiple small vesicles is actually happening and mostly you can see on the posterior uh, of uh, the pharynx especially on tonsils also you can appreciate here as well so these are happening and for this one i think i have already opened it for you Okay, leave it for now. That's the other thing. So let me take you to the question. Uh, let me take you to the theory again. So here it's saying that only just think about Coxsackie A virus, and you will appreciate that there are too many vesicles, multiple vesicles, which is more than one millimeter size in posterior orifice. We here you have it seen also there are multiple vesicles, uh, more than one millimeter, one millimeter, especially on the pharynx side, on the posterior wall of the pharynx. Now. If we can look at the questions. Excuse me, Dr. Hira, Coxsackie A virus causes another infection. What is that infection? Alpstein Bauer virus, EBV. Yes. Sorry? Uh, Alpstein Bauer virus, EBV, EBV it's infection. Also, it's also called EBV or there is an infection called EBV? No, no, there is an infection, Alpstein Bauer virus infection. That uh, one of the reason is Coxsackie as well. The infectious name is Alpstein Bauer. Okay, here no, the question this, is. Hmm. No, the infection, Coxie virus causes, that is called EBV? EBV is the name of the virus, but it's also one of the name of the infection, where we can see one of the species of the Coxie type A can cause Arbstein virus, but sometimes Phytomodella virus infection can also this one. So these are all virus activities. So what actually your question is? What, what do you want to ask? I want to ask, there is another infection caused by Coxie virus. What is that infection? A uh, coxsackie type A or coxsackie type B? A or B? Both. You are asking. What? There is another infection. That is that is by B. See, it's mentioned that. Uh, for coxsackie, this one of this type A, we have already done this one, uh, herpingina. There is another one which which is called hand foot mouth disease. That's again caused by coxsackie yeah, yeah. type A, right? Now, yeah, that, there, oh, yeah, that that's that that is the one I am asking. Hand, okay, hand foot and mouth disease you are asking. That is actually one of the type of coxsackie virus syndrome infections. So multiple things are involved in the whole body. No, that is caused by coxsackie A virus, huh? Yes, yes, that is caused by coxsackie. Yeah, it's it's numbers in numbers also it's mentioned the same, right? And foot so, mouth disease. Yeah, and foot mouth that. disease. Ah, yes. And so this one. Gina is also caused by the same virus, huh? Yeah. Yes. 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 Herpingina and or here only oral involvement. Ah, exactly oral involvement. Not foot okay. and okay foot and hand. See, hand, foot, and uh, mouth disease is actually once the patient is presenting with all over features like this one, then easily you can diagnose that is a hand, foot, and mouth. So because you are appreciating all over the areas, but once it's it's located only on the mouth side or only the buccal mucosa is involved, we can say it's okay. It's a it's a herpingia because it's only restricted to the mouth. Okay, so let's have a look at this question. A four-year-old. Yes. In other words, in other words, we can say if is. Uh, if if limited to the uh, mouth is hyperjana, if it uh, extends to the hand and fit, then it's had a foot and mouth disease, huh? Yes, so presentation should be like that. Blisters on the hand, blisters on the feet, blisters uh, inside the buccal mucosa, then of course you will say it's a hand foot mouth disease. Yes. So based on the presentation, the name will be changed. But if in case, especially in case of hyperjana, you will not see any involvement. Even the involvement will not be there on the lips. Like in the case of herpes, we are seeing multiple uh, blisters on the lips. It's not there. So in herpes in China, we will only see inside the buccal mucosa. Like pharynx are involved, tonsils are involved. So inside, inside you will have That is also one of the difference. But the difference between herpes infection and the infection. 
okay can you ask the uh, participants to please mute their mic yeah there is too much distortion over there let me mute all and those who want to ask anything please ask ha huh? all of you are on mute okay let's solve this question a four year old child a three with a three day history of fever irritability and anorexia so fever is there irritability is there anorexia loss of, uh, loss of appetite is there on examination confirms the painful vesicles over the mucosa of the soft palate and posterior pharynx so see you have uh, examined the pharynx posterior pharynx is involved palate is involved there are multiple vesicles on the uh, this one is sparing the gingiva there is no involvement of the gums and anterior oral cavity blood pressure and everything is okay but temperature is raised of course when the temperature is raised heart rate will be increased which of the following is the most likely diagnosis so what do you think what it can be if the child who is 4 years old presenting with multiple vesicles especially over the posterior pharynx and palate and so see it is a fever rest is not involved only the posterior pharynx and palate is involved so which of the following is the most likely diagnosis so do you think it's a congenital epulis congenital epulis is actually a granular cell tumor so i've already opened one diagram for you for this one so that you can easily de differentiate what is this one this is congenital epulis so this epulis is actually the granular cell tumor of gingiva so the the gums actually you can say it's a tumor of the gums and mostly the child uh, it's a congenital one so the baby should be you know born with this thing so what you will do it's a newborn baby having this gum tumor and you can just resect this one so we'll see after surgery this is the picture after surgery it, it's gone completely so this is one of the so of course this is not the presentation here so this is not the answer afterwards ulcers afterwards ulcers these are you can easily appreciate and they are mostly you know inside the lower lip i'll show you this one afterwards ulcers again they are very common but the presentation let me show you this ulcer this is the same epilepsy baby having too much granular cell tumor gingiva I have already shown you this one. Let me show you. I think it's not there. Atrophic ulcers. See, atrophic ulcers. You can see easily. See, it's one of the. most of the time they are only solitary or maybe two or three you can appreciate all together it's not like a multiple vesicles on uh, each side you can see only one like this let me one or two where is the picture can't see so the, it's mostly on the you know it's mostly on the uh, inner side of the lower lip you can easily see mostly on the inner side and sometimes it's it's around the gingiva also but you cannot appreciate this aqueous ulcer you know in the posterior wall of the pharynx or over the palate or over the tonsils they are usually solitary and you will find them you know mostly inside the lower lip the so presentation based on the presentation you cannot say it's aqueous ulcer because posterior here in the question the posterior involvement posterior pharynx is involved and palate is involved so that's most and multiple vesicles so that's most likely herpingina gingival cyst it's a cyst over the gum so of course we will not find anything here gums are absolutely normal the the baby is sparing the gingival anterior wall cavity there is nothing in the anterior oral cavity there is nothing on the gingiva so of course gingival cyst is excluded herpingina is the one where we can find multiple ulcers presented located posteriorly especially on the posterior pharynx all over the tonsils over the palate and there should be multiple one that's a clear case of herpingina okay for the next one we'll go for the theory first next we have this shigella infection so shigella also we will go for ampus because it's not there much in mtb and then i stand let me close this one there are too many windows open okay and as again what the cell granular cell case i have done this one herpingina okay 
here we have shigella so shigella or shigellosis is the one which is caused by shigella infection shigella virus so here the problem is we have too many types of shigella so mostly we are dealing with this shigella dysentery infection but we have this flaxnery we have this boidy or somini so there are many types of shigella but most of the time which we are referring to is actually shigellosis caused by this shigella dysentery so humans are the only host it's obligate pathogen it has to complete the whole cycle and human is spread from cell to cell invasion of m cells called mal cells so that's a special invasion of cells we will find in this infection resistant to gastric acid low in fractious dose so even gastric acid is not, not going to work on this infection and this fastidious two samples required from testing of course you cannot diagnose shigella you cannot say the patient is having shigellosis until and unless you see this shigella strains especially and this of course they think slow absent lactose fermentation so the uh, it's the process will be slow because there will be absence of this lactic acid or lactose fermentation and because of that the process of forming of this infection of multiplying the organism will take some time but there will be so it's a slowly progressive infection it cannot multiply you know like the way the virus and bacteria usually multiply it will take some time immune response primarily via uh, pn pmn infiltration so this post molecular nuclear cells especially you are called lymphocytes so we will see lymphocytes and neutrophils will come and they will get over this infection of course neutrophils and lymphocytes lymphocytes are actually the one which are in the tissue especially called macrophages they are the first body line defenders and neutrophils in the in the blood they are the first body line defenders so actually they have this sugar toxin and this sugar toxin is responsible for creating this one so shigellosis that is called bloody diarrhea we will see bloody diarrhea the most of the time patient presented with lower abdominal pain crampy abdominal pain and having blood obvious blood and that is bloody diarrhea now this is the complication so this infection is not going to only be in the in the uh, this gastrointestinal area but of course you will see some extra intestinal manifestation and that is going to be considered as a complication so this is one of the most important complication of this shigella and that is hemolytic uremic syndrome and there is one more which is not mentioned here but you should know that they are usually associated with the seizures if the baby is having infection especially the children uh, having the ages less than 14 years of age if they are having this shigellosis infection they may present with because this shigellosis present with the fever as well so they may present with the febrile fits tonic clonic seizures can be there in the babies and that's obvious that's very obvious that they have this infection and after infection the baby has undergone a fit fit attack so there also be a presentation and once this hemolytic uremic syndrome it's a vasculitis so vessels are also involved so it's a disseminated infection it's not going to be in the gi but you will find in the vessels as well causing this hemolytic uremic syndrome you will find the neurologic manifestations like, like in the form i have told you just now that the baby can present the children can present with seizures or having a fit after having this diarrheal infection so shortens the period in which shigella is shed in stool we can use fluoroquinolones we can use antibiotics ciprofloxacin the third generation cephalosporin ceftriaxone can be used just you know to treat this infection so treatment part is okay but most of the time it's a it's the complication questions which they usually ask what would be the complication based on shigella infection so remember this thing that this hemolytic uremic syndrome and especially the febrile convulsions or seizures or tonic clonic convulsions after having a diarrheal attack bloody diarrheal attack always think about shigellosis so here i, I just want to show you that uh, this is also one of the shigella infection from the mat skin here you can see here i just wanted to show you the symptoms see sudden onset of severe abdominal cramping high grade fever that's why the children you know can have this attack tonic clonic attack emesis anorexia weight loss can be and seizures may be a early manifestation for this i have just mentioned here that please remember this point seizures is the most commonly com complication or early manifestation where the children can present with sudden after having this bloody diarrheal attack so of course abdominal pain and everything Dr. Tyra, oh, you cannot hear me. I'm, I'm having a call from Dr. Tyra. Can you hear me, guys? You cannot hear me. We can. Uh, hear we you. can hear you, ma'am. I can hear you. I cannot hear you. You have. I'm. You have muted us, Dr. Hira. Can you hear me? No, we can hear you, but you have muted us. Okay, so you cannot unmute your mic. 
no no i i can i thought you have you said i will mute all of you so i thought i would not be able to unmute myself no 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 you can unmute i said i told you that i have muted all because i don't know from where the noise is actually coming i But, thought uh, i will not be able to unmute ah uh, okay okay sorry no, no of course so you can to, so how to differentiate between sigillosis and amebiasis at the presentation and amebiasis you will have always <coughs> mucus mucus bloody diarrhea in sigillosis there must be uh, and especially the presentation like in the subtropical tropical area no, and the hygiene we, Shigellosis and amebiasis both will have bloody diarrhea, but in in uh, shigellosis there is a severe bloody diarrhea, and the presentation the presentation like the the patient will be mucus will be present in amebiasis. Whenever the mucus is mentioned, only think about amebiasis. Whenever it says mucus, because that's a typical feature of amebiasis, uh, and it may be loose watery also. But in shigellosis, you can never find loose watery. You will always find severe bloody diarrhea. severe bloody diarrhea especially after having this cane food or especially because it's mostly happened because of the food poisoning so there must be a history of some cane intake of cane food like you know uh, the food which has processed so many times so many uh, hours back or maybe a must a cane food so something like that but for amebiasis of course the protozoal infection so hand hygiene and everything like tropical area environmental some environmental factors must be involved but in case of shigellosis no you you just have you know the hazardous thing is the processed food but uh, most of the time and sometimes it's okay you will you will not find any particular cause okay. it's not it's not related to endemic thing okay but amebiasis is always endemic it is so here the seizures i just wanted to show you here and here this is a case history actually where i just wanted to show you how this baby is actually having this uh, shigellosis febrile convulsion soon after having this bloody diarrhea so it's just a thing i have told you it's one of the case history here so let me take you to the question an 18 month old old child presents to the emergency department after a brief generalized tonic clonic seizure see so tonic clonic seizure is there she he, he has landed in the emergency department he has had a large watery stool that had both blood and mucus in it he is now post ictus so here the confusing thing for you must be that watery stool has mentioned but both blood and mucus so you cannot easily differentiate whether it's a it's a watery stool or mucus stool both blood and mucus are there the important finding is this the baby soon after having this diarrhea baby went into a clon tonic clonic seizure episode the pressure is okay heart rate is on uh, it's okay it must old respect rate okay but fever so high grade fever with a with a convulsion attack soon after having a diarrheal episode that is a bloody diarrhea of course this this the mother has told you large watery stool diarrhea that has both blood and mucus in it but for for our point of view we should know that it should be a bloody diarrhea and soon after an episode of bloody diarrhea because of the fever effects are there only one organism is responsible for this one and that is shigella not in any other case you will find only in the case of e coli we will find this hemolytic uremic syndrome but again e coli hemolytic uremic syndrome and shigella hemolytic uremic syndrome but again there will be no neurological manifestation in any other kind of gastrointestinal infection we have only this shigella is the one which can cause neurological manifestation and that is febrile convulsions and but but there should be a history soon after having a bloody diarrheal episode the baby or whoever is there uh undergone a seizure attack or a fit attack then always think about shigella infection which of the following is the most likely cause campylobacter is one of the most common uh, you know uh, infection a gastrointestinal infection but of course that again associated with the with the processed food or some food poisoning history maybe the patient is having uh, you know a restaurant history will be their dinner dinner or lunch as well lunch or dinner history something like that but for campylobacter you will never ever see any kind of neurological manifestation salmonella again salmonella infection we will never see neurological manifestation again salmonella can cause bloody diarrhea most of the time it's called watery diarrhea not bloody diarrhea and most of the time those children who are dealing with the packs so say for example cat or turtles or or sometime when we are actually washing the you know uh, these uh, 
uh, chicken or meat so sometimes we are not actually you know washing up uh, the hand hygiene is not properly maintained so they are usually present salmonella and that kind of thing so say for example in chicken or meat unwashed uh, before cooking if we are handling these thing and we are not actually washing hands and we are eating something uh, without washing hands so we, we may prone to get have this salmonella but again salmonella is not associated with bloody diarrhea and again salmonella is not associated with any kind of neurological manifestation once it says neurological manifestation always think about shigella rotavirus again it's a viral infection mostly in the neonatal age you will find there will be a watery severe watery diarrhea whenever it says severe watery diarrhea in children in neonates especially a uh, neonate means one month old and from uh, infant means one year old so in neonates and infants if it says severe watery diarrhea always think about rotavirus whenever it says severe bloody diarrhea always think about shigella infection so here based on the presentation like he is having uh, the baby is having fits after the bloody diarrheal attack we will always think about shigella excuse me dr hira is uh, yes. shigellosis also referred as uh, bacillary dysentery yes dear that's another name of shigellosis shigellosis or bacillary dysentery is caused by shigella dysentriae the name of the organism shigella dysentriae yes excuse me dr hira Yeah, it's clear in numbers also. Let me show you that first. See, uh, shigellosis is bloody diarrhea. Yes, dear. Uh, we will not have blood in Salmonella syndrome. No, no, no. Your usual presentation we don't have until and unless it's severe and continuous and recurrent infection. Then only sometimes this blood mucosal involvement is there because continuous shedding of the gastrointestinal epithelium. Then we may we, we may find some traces, but no. In Salmonella, we usually have bloody diarrhea. and copilot bacteria with there be food poisoning or something after eating some food yeah food. and it's a very common infection once you know after having uh, eat, after eating something outside of the uh, if someone commits diarrhea we will always think about copilot bacteria that's the first common cause i always find very difficult these uh, diarrhea and, and their organisms and differentiating uh, it will take some time just repeat repeat again and again that's all the thing we can do. <laughs> it's it's good in in ambos all the diarrhea causing agents are mentioned in one go so you can go over this one it's it's, it's going to be very helpful the link is there sure the link is the link is there but, uh, the link is here na i've mentioned you the link here this link is this one so once you click on this link it will show you all the infections not only shigella so, you will find every we, infection if we click here we can go to embers yes you can go to embers or even even though if you don't have an account of embers you can create for 5 days even sometime embers has some glitch <laughs> it can open directly without having login details so you can go over it until unless they will ask you to sign up and all that but most of the time when when i have when i don't have the sample account i usually go go with the link and with the link it usually opens they will not ask you the login details okay okay so let's get back to the questions okay for this one we have to go for the theory first then we have mumps so for mumps we'll go for mtb but mtb is not in much in detail but i wanted to show you an mtb also plus we'll go to the ambus so triple eight we go so here it's only this much we have in ambus that what is the causative agent that is a paramyxovirus so what is the presentation we will see fever precede classic parotid gland swelling now here again very important point is mumps always we will find the feature that the parotid gland is going to involve first and once the parotid gland is involved as a complication as a manifestation outside you know the the parotid gland you may find the child can have the infection or inflammation of testes because of this that's called orchitis and it can go and retrograde going to the brain and can cause meningitis and encephalitis as well so it's same like uh, the one which we have dealt with the post streptococcal the infection start at the glomerulus and it will go up or sometime you know the infection is up and it can go down the same is here but here you should always remember that first of all parotid gland is going to involve always always you can never ever make a diagnosis whenever there is a history of arthritis first and then you will think about parotid, par, uh, this one mumps no for the mumps the the main preliminary thing should be the involvement of parotid gland and once the parotid gland is involved then there, there will be a dissemination of infection it can go into the brain and cause meningitis encephalitis it can go into the testes and cause arthritis it can go even into the pancreas cause pancreas 
pancreatitis. So that's, that will be the complications and manifestation of this infection. But the primary thing which is going to involve is always to be the pavoted one. So with possible arthritis is the complication, but it's not in detail. So I, I, I just want to, you know, you to have a look at this one. Let me close all this one. Okay, I've done this one. Rotavirus. Rotavirus. Mumps, yeah. So see, for mumps, it's a highly contagious viral infection that is transmitted via airborne droplet. So it's contagious. It's contagious. It's airborne infection. It's a viral infection. The incidence is now very low in US. Why? Because nowadays we are giving MMR vaccines to our children. So there's less likely chance that the baby is going to commit mumps. But maybe in those areas where we don't have, uh, where the children don't have access to MMR vaccine, they are more prone to get develop this one. But of course, in, in well-developed countries, we will not find this one. The condition primarily affects children between the ages of 5 and 14. Classically, it manifests with parotitis, which initially occurs unilaterally. So first on one side, and then again, both of, both of the sides will be involved. The parotid gland will involve. And you will see uh, that uh, the lateral cheek and jaw area usually show marked swelling, and the ears may protrude. There will be a protrusion of the ear. You will see the swelling, especially swelling is quite obvious mentioning in the lateral cheek area and the jaw area. Other symptoms include low-grade fever. So fever can be there, but it will not be a high-grade fever. Malaise, headache, possible swelling of other slavery glands. So parotid is one of the slavery glands. They have sublingual and some mandibular glands as well. So they may also involve. The diagnosis of mums is largely based on clinical finding. When you see this parotid gland swelling over the lateral cheek, Think about this mom. Many cases, however, present with non-specific features and are not easily organizable as mom. If possible, diagnosis should be confirmed with lab test. So we will see what, what are the lab tests. We will do in complications. We will see orchitis, meningitis, pancreatitis. Hearing loss can also be there. So this is the clinical feature incubation. Most of the time for infectious agent, not for the DHA point of view or NOH point of view, but if those who are appearing for USMLE exam, they should know the incubation time periods as well. So, but for us, it's okay. But you should know that's the incubation time period of organism. Like for this one is 16 to 18 days. Now, maybe and prodome, it's not started at once. It will take some time. So duration can take three to four days. Symptoms will be low grade fever, malaise, headache. We have already done this one. Uh, it's okay, it's nothing new here. I wanted to show you how we are going to diagnose these patients. So for diagnosis, of course, lab test. So we will do real-time reverse transcriptive PCR testing. On PCR testing, because it's a virus, so we can only go for the PCR testing. Or maybe we can check the IgM levels. Of course, IgM levels will be increased. Whenever there's a viral infection, because of the increased lymphocytosis, we may find immunoglobin M, which is the main precursor, will be increased. So IgM is increased on PCR. Definitely, this, this virus is going to be detected. So you can easily make the diagnosis. These are all the supportive testing. You can see the MLAs will be increased. ESR, of course, showing the infectious rate. CRP showing the infectious rate. But of course, increasing the CRP level, increasing the ESR level will never give you a clue that this is a this is a mum. It will give you a clue. Of course, there is an infection going on in the body. But what exactly it is, you have to go for PCR testing. And see, these are the complications of chitis, testes are involved in cephalitis, meningitis, pancreatitis, hearing loss sometimes can also occur because of the mumps. So we'll go to the question. Which of the following is the most commonly affected by mumps in a four-year-old boy? So see, but most commonly affected, of course, it always, always start with the parotid gland. Later on, it can go to the testes and brain, meninges and pancreas. So, but first of all, you will always find parotid. So first of all, parotid is involved and then testes involvement can be there. So orchitis can be there, but don't choose testes here okay? because uh, one of the group member was actually uh, debating on this one, that testicle involvement. Why testicle involvement? Testicle involvement is the second thing. It's actually the complication of the uh, of the mom. So first parotid should be involved and then it will go to the testes and anywhere in the body. Okay, so the next one will go for the theory first. Oral thrush candidiasis, we have dealt very much in detail when we were covering the vaginal candidiasis. It's the same candida albicans infection, but it's actually involving the mouth this time. So if it's uh, occurring in the mouth, the same same happening, the whitish plaque you will see in the mouth, that's called oral candidiasis. And the, another name of oral candidiasis is oral thrush. So we'll look at the others. 
this one. Yeah, this can be BSS and can be BSS if we find it in the oral cavity, this oropharyngeal, that's the oral thrush, pseudomembranous can be BSS, the another name. You will see white plaque on examination when you do the examination of oral cavity that can be scraped off, giving way to red inflamed or bleeding area. So when you're going to scrape that white plaque, it's going to start it bleeding. Cottony feeling in the mouth, loss of taste, and in some cases pain while eating, of course. So there will be no feeling of taste, especially, and cottony feeling. The patient must be saying there's some cotton inside my mouth. Fissuring at the mouth corners can also be there, which you can appreciate. So if these features are there, and again, if the patient is diabetic, you can if the patient is immunocompromised, especially, you can think about oral candidiasis. And what you're going to get, of course, it's a fungal infection. You will get antifungal. Most likely, you will get oral nystatin drops. So they have mentioned every kind of candidiasis here but for the oral thing with oral candidiasis first line is topical nystatin must remember or you can give a oral fluconazole tablet also alternative if treatment fails you can go for any azole hyperconazole vericanazole so these are all antifungals you can give but most of the time it will be topical nystatin so let's have a look at the question a one month old infant referred to the dental clinic. Now he is just one month old with presentation of white plaques visible on the surfaces of the dorsal tongue and heart palate, which can be wiped off. A clinical diagnosis was made and the infant was started on nystatin four times. So already, already a uh, physician has you know made the diagnosis and already nystatin is started. For the 10 days, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? They have given you everything. Now they're just asking you for the diagnosis. White plaque is there and they already started nystatin. So there is no ambiguity in solving this question. It's always a clear cut question of which one. Do you think it's a erythematous scandidiasis or gingival state viral hypoplakia? It's a clear case of oral thrush. Based on their treatment, they have already started and based on the presentation. Why it's not uh, erythematous scandidiasis? Erythematous scandidiasis means that only erythema is associated. Most of the time it's happening on the skin. But for if it's only in the oral cavity, we have to say thrush, oral thrush. Like in this case, he's in the dental clinic. Gingivostomatitis is only the inflammation of the gingiva and some angle of the mouth, you can see they are going to inflate. But here there is nothing involvement of the gums. Leukoplakia. Leukoplakia is the one which you can confuse because leukoplakia is again the whitish covering over over the tongue especially you cannot but it's the only one point on the basis of which you can differentiate is a leukoplakia and oral thrush once you scrape the tongue if the whitish layer is is wiped out that's a candidiasis but leukoplakia no matter how long and how how hard you are trying to remove that will not go away because it's a tumor right so on leukoplakia you are not able to remove the whitish plaque so that's an oral leukoplakia. But if you are able to remove the plaque, that's a candidiasis. Right? That's the only difference you're going to make in, in terms of leukoplakia and oral thrush. The next one, we'll go for the theory first. Then we have this Biscott Aldrich syndrome. For this one, we'll go for both of these one, MTB and this one. In MTB, it's not much in detail, but I wanted to show you in MTB. 403. So this Biscott Eldrick syndrome, this is an immunodeficiency combined with thrombocytopenia. So overall, the person is going to be immunodeficient and there will be less platelet count and you will find some skin changes. So whoever who is immunodeficient and having, you know, this skin problem, especially eczema is all over there, platelet counts are low, T lymphocytes are markedly deficient in the blood and lymph node, bone marrow transplantation is the only. So of course it's a syndrome. In syndrome, we always find two or more deficiencies or, or uh, disorders. So that is called syndrome. So here, what are the deficiencies or disorder? The patient must be having the skin infection, eczema. If the patient is having low platelet count and the patient, of course, is immunocompromised. If these three things are there, you can, you know, you, you will be able to make a diagnosis of this one. But it should be, we should do in detail. That's why I'll take you to the ambulance. 
So see, it's Viscott Eldricks syndrome. It's a genetic condition. Of course, it's a it's a genetic uh, disorder characterized by impaired function of P lymphocytes. We have B lymphocytes, so we have P lymphocytes. These lymphocytes are responsible for making our whole immune system. B lymphocytes they will convert into plasma cells and they form antibodies. T lymphocytes they will divide into cytotoxic T cells and killer cells and helper T cells. They are actually doing what? They will support in another way. Like forming this, especially you know, the, the helping helping in the process of antigen antibody reaction. But B lymphocytes are the one which itself convert into antibodies, and they will just attack on antigen. But T lymphocytes, they are the supporting thing. They can cause cytotoxicity. They can cause they will help the B lymphocytes. They are called helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. So whenever you will find that T cells are not working properly and the platelet deficiency is there together, you will think about this one. The Scott Eldrick syndrome occurs primarily in males because it's an X-linked disorder, X-linked recessive disorder. Only X is going to carry this one. So in male, only one X is there. So of course, that X is involved. The males are more prone towards getting this infection. Impaired signaling to actin, cytoskeleton, reorganization, defective antigen presentation. So here you will see uh, this defective antigen presentation. Just memorize this one is an X-linked disorder. So most likely, Hira? yes, uh, Dr. Hira, what you told about this X-linked recessive inheritance? X-linked recessive means that X only X is going to carry. So in male, we have only one X, right? Males means XY. So Y is not carrying anything. So it's an X-linked recessive. Recessive means that if someone is having two X, like females, females have two X, right? So if one X is having this disorder and other X is absolutely normal, that female is not going to present with Viscott symptoms. Why? Because she has one normal X. But in males, it's only one X. So if that X is having a disease, then definitely the males are more prone towards getting this infection. So that is the reason. And it's called X-linked recessive. Why recessive? Because if one is do one dominant X is normal, then this disease will not be a dominant disease. This will be a recessive disease. Means that person is not going to show you any symptom of this part. If the if the woman is having women because having two X, if one X is normal and one X is having this Viscott syndrome gene, but because it's a recessive disorder, so that female is not going to present with the symptoms at all. But she is a recessive carrier. The once she gives birth, yes, females one. Or will be all the carriers, they will not. Yeah, so them. once once that female is going to give a baby boy birth, that baby can have this one because she has two X. So maybe if she if she uh, she's going to give that X who's having this Viscott gene, that boy is going to be a, a symptom of a baby, a victim of this one because the boy is only having one X. Okay, 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 thank you. So Clinical feature, onset of symptoms from birth. So it's a classic triad feature. What is a triad? Three things you are going to see in your patient. Because of the low platelet count, the, the patient must be having purpurus. Purpurus means bleeding diastasis. Because of the deficiency of platelet, the, 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 the body is going to more prone towards bleeding. So you will find purpura. Eczema. There will, be, there will be too much involvement of the skin and recurrent opportunistic infection because overall immunity is low. Why immunity is low? Because, because it's a case where the T cells are deficient and T cells are the one who's actually forming our immunity. So when the T cells are deficient, the patient is going to be more prone having infection. So of course, and these babies and these children who have this one, they usually present with otitis media, recurrent infection, recurrent sinus infection, recurrent eye infection, recurrent you know throat infection. So multiple ears infection. Everybody is involving again and again and again. Infectious is there. So that is always think about. So the the mother is complaining. My my uh, child is you know is very prone to get this throat infection every now and then. Like oh every after two or three weeks the throat is involved. The ears are started paining and leaking and pus is there. So think about the baby is having immunodeficiency syndrome or some some kind of immune deficiency is there. What kind we will relate to what kind of syndrome the baby is having. So here on diagnosis, how we are going to diagnose the baby is having this one, the normal or decreased IgG and IgM, of course, antibodies you can find normal because B cells are working fine. Only T cells are the one which are deficient here. Allergy, in, because of the immunodeficiency, allergens can be allergic history is there. So you will find increased IgE levels. Thrombocytopenia is a clear feature because it's a main feature of this syndrome. You will find low platelet count here. So treatment, what you're going to give? Whoever immunoglobin is deficient, you will give that immunoglobin. So IV immunoglobin therapy is the one. Antibiotic, prophylactic, antibiotic, prophylactic. It's not like that the baby is having 
just in order to prevent the baby going into something we will just prevent the baby why because baby is immunodeficient so we can provide prophylactic antibiotic platelet transfusion of course platelets are low you can easily transfuse them from outside stem cell transplantation may be curative so by by doing this transplantation actually we are helping the baby to develop its own t cells formation because t cell is again is the one important part in making an immunity so let's have a look at the question here the question is saying a seven year old boy has had recurrent upper and lower respiratory tract bacterial infection whenever it says recurrent infection always think about the baby's immune deficient immune deficient there can be any reason because of immune deficiency it may be genetic it may be viral like hiv virus it may be like this syndrome this spot syndrome it may be just because of antigen antibody reaction it can be any type but once it's a recurrent infection is happening in the body always think about immune deficiency so tract bacterial infection since infancy on examination he has eczema now eczema with immune deficient symptoms and area of ichymosis ichymosis is another name for purpura so means low platelet count his brother and paternal uncle are similarly affected so it's a genetic one so genetic involvement is there now you have seen the hemoglobin slightly on lower side wbcs are okay platelets are severely low 40 very much low normal count is 150 to 400 so thrombocytopenia associated with the skin infection eczema associated with purpuras associated with recurrent infection means immunodeficient all will help us in making a diagnosis of wisport albrecht syndrome so we have these other other autoimmune syndromes also say for example this severe combined immunodeficiency this severe combined immunodeficiency whenever the question says the baby is showing failure to thrive the baby is showing severe weight loss the baby has a history of big sibling who has died with septicemia who has died because of some unknown infection means you will see in the whole family the whole family of that person who is having this severe immuno uh, severe combined immunodeficiency is immunodeficient and there will be a list of death in the family is because of any any infection with sepsis is there and the patient died so why the patient is dying because of sepsis that can be curable also but once the patient is immunodeficient he will not be, you know he is not going to progress the prognosis is very poor gluten a gamma globulinemia also is one of the x link is one of the genetic uh, immunodeficiency syndrome dijorge again is one of the genetic syndrome so all these are immunocompromised syndromes where we can see that the clear cut deficiency in the gene that is responsible for making and this uh, helper b cells making this uh, antibody formation b cells and where we can easily differentiate but among all this biscot is the one who is presenting with the eczema who is presenting with the low platelet count who is presenting with the recurrent infection which is showing immunodeficiency that's a clear case of biscot and triad should always look for the triad skin infection overall recurrent infection showing immunodeficiency plus what is ichymosis purpura thrombocytopenia thrombocytopenia exactly the next one we have to go for the theory first kawasaki disease kawasaki disease again very not, uh, it's not very much in detail in fact very little info is there in the mtb we will go for the ambers hmm. here we have kawasaki so kawasaki disease is actually one of the vasculitis vessels are involved there will be a necrotizing vasculitis all the vessels all over the vessels inside the body they are going to inflamed at a level where the necrosis has occurred necrosis usually you know it's not occurring in, in just a jiffy it will take some time first there will be ischemia then there will be you know reversible ischemia or irreversible ischemia if it's irreversible ischemia then it will only go for necrosis necrosis means complete cell death so here the vessels are involved in such a way that there will be no reversible ischemia there will be irreversible ischemia and there will be necrosis of the vessel wall so that is called kawasaki disease the condition primarily affects children under the age of 5 and is more common among those of asian descent the disease is characterized by high fever desquamative rash think about everywhere the body who is having vessel can present with the manifestation so conjunctivitis can be there mucositis will be there once you, you know you examine the tongue and tongue will be like strawberry tongue so if it's mentioned strawberry tongue that's a clear case of vasculitis cervical lymphadenopathy overall overall uh, you know this vascular 
because of the vascular insufficiency, we will find this lymphatic channels also involved there, and we will find cervical lymphadenopathy as well as erythema, edema of the distal extremities. So, of course, erythema, edema, it's all because of the vasculitis changes. However, coronary artery aneurysm are the most concerning possible manifestation as they can lead to myocardial infarction or arrhythmia. So, because it's the overall involvement of the vessels, so think about think about if this coronary arteries are going to be involved, then what will happen? Anything can happen to that patient. That patient can go into myocardial infarction, that patient can go into arrhythmia because that's the involvement of the coronary artery. Kawasaki disease is a clinical diagnosis for the supported findings such as elevated ESR. So ESR, of course, will, will give you a clue that inflammation and infection is going on. But what kind of infection? We have to go for the particular lab testing. We'll see it here. Uh, treatment with IV immunoglobins, of course, once the overall inflammation is involved, we have to give immunoglobin, high dose aspirin is essential and should be initially immediately after diagnosis. We can put on our patient on aspirin that is going to dilute the blood. At least we can just do this favor that we will dilute the blood so that the pressure inside the overall the venous, venous, blood, venous circulation will be decreased and the cardiac output will be decreased and the heart will be in less stress and it's going to have more blood to work on. So this we can provide aspirin and immunoglobin as a, as a primary thing we will give. So what are the clinical feature? How the baby is going to present? Dr. Yes, dear. Strawberry tongue is found in the scarlet fever. Yes, in scarlet fever also. But here in Kawasaki disease, also one of the physical examination. When you do this, so this particularly one of the findings is discoloration of the hand skin. Sorry, uh, what, what skin? Hands. Discoloration of the skin of hands. See, in Kawasaki, because Kawasaki is a generalized vascular disorder, so you will find overall body involvement. So it's not about, you will find erythema all over the body. You will find erythema, no, erythema all over the, the body. of the skin. Disquamation of the skin of the head. Desquamation. So Desquamation you're talking. Desquamation, right? D-E-S-Q-A-M-A-T-I-E-G. Desquamation yeah, yeah. means that the squamous cell of the skin is actually going to uh, wipe off. No, 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 no. I am trying to say there will be discommission of the skin of the hands, yes. particularly hands. Yes, yes. Kawasaki disease. Yes, not only in hands, you find in the feet also, you find all over the body as well. But yeah, of course, most likely why in they? Because they are the most dependent gravity, gravity organ. Huh? Most movement involvement is there. So you are going to find it more commonly here. But it can be all over because it's generalized. You cannot say only the hand vessels are actually vasculitis, showing vasculitis. At the time where it's actually necrosis is happening. So it can be anywhere in the world. But most likely, of course, hands are going to be the presentation. Okay. okay, so here what you will see, erythma edema of the hands and feet, including the palms and soul, the first week. So first week, the hands and feet, because why feet? Because of the gravity assistant, you will find more. Why hands? Because the most dependent part of our body. So you will find hands and feet both involvement. Possible desquamation of fingertips and toes after two to three weeks. Then you will find fingertips and toes both are involved. You will see desquamation is there. Then polymorphous rash all over the trunk. You can find rash anywhere. Painless bilateral injected conjunctivitis without exit. So in eyes also you will find conjunctivitis. In oral mucosa you will also find mucositis. Erythema and swelling of the tongue will be there. Strawberry tongue. So on. You, you see you are you are actually seeing everything is going to be involved on the priority basis. So first of all dependent areas and gravity assisted areas that is going to involve and then you will see all over. Cracked and red lips will be the presentation. So just look for these all the symptoms because these are the symptoms which should help you in making a diagnosis. So strawberry tongue, red lips, bilateral. If you are if you are seeing this, uh, this the finger toes are involving the finger tips, uh, fingertips and toes are involving. This formation is there. Cervical lymphadenopathy, which is mostly unilateral, but you can find cervical lymphadenopathy as well in these patients. So this is also one of the clue in making a diagnosis. So most of the most of the time, presentation is the one on the basis you can make the diagnosis. And they usually ask the question. They give you three four findings and they will ask you a diagnosis. The non-specific symptom, Kawasaki sometimes can present with diarrhea, abdominal pain, arthritis. But of course, these are not the symptoms on the basis of which you can easily make a diagnosis. They are just the thing that this thing can also happen. But these are the non-specific symptoms. On the basis of this, you will not be able to make a diagnosis. So of course, if someone is presenting with arthritis, how you can think about Kawasaki, it's not possible, right? So these are non-specific symptoms. 
always consider kawasaki disease in small children with a rash and high fever unresponsive to antibiotic you have already given a trial of antibiotic but nothing has has happened then we can think about kawasaki disease that is again one of the clue but it's it's again not a hard and fast rule but this is based on evidence practice clinical evidence based practice that most of the time when we are giving a, we have already given a trial of antibiotic but still the child who is aged less than 5 years of age is not improving and the rash is still there the fever is still there we can think about kawasaki so what are the symptoms rash and burn this is just a mnemonic for you to help you memorize conjunctivitis rash adenopathy strawberry tongue hands feet and burn means fever more than 5 days are the most common features of kawasaki disease so how you are going to diagnose your children of course you will go for the lab testing so first you will see the the general markers will be increased like high esr crt will just give you a clue that infection is going on leukocytosis must be there because there is infection inflammation thrombocytosis everything will be on the higher side on echocardiography you will see you will evaluate coronary artery aneurysm if it's there the big artery involvement is there you will appreciate on echocardiography minimal evaluation should be performed and diagnosed at 2 weeks and 6 to 8 weeks after onset so of course if um, uh, you cannot diagnose this disease because it will take some time at least it will take 2 weeks to fully develop the symptoms so it will take time and after 6 to 8 weeks also it will not be you know very helpful in making a diagnosis because these lab findings are not the one which is very much definitive findings so it's a, just a clinical diagnosis so treatment what we will give we will give immunoglobulins high sensitive dose to reduce the coronary artery aneurysm so they are uh, actually pointing towards coronary artery aneurysm why because that's the main artery the main biggest artery of your body is aorta that's why they are asking they are they are more into you know dealing with the coronary artery aneurysm most effective is given within the first 10 days uh, following effective so it's okay if the patient has just started the symptom just start now immunoglobulin if the time has passed then then this immunoglobulin may not work then we will give aspirin as a as a blood diluter iv glucocorticoids may be considered in addition to standard treatment especially in the treatment refractory refractory treatment you can give glucocorticoid that is going to suppress the inflammation so these are you see these are all just the supportive treatment now let's have a look at the questions dr hira can you yes, do sir. the tip tips there were tips and links what are the tips here there is a link for cdc you will when you click on this one it will take you to cdc page no no i thought there is some tip to remember ah, something like this okay so you, what you is cdc this? CDC is a it's a main organization which is actually uh, preventing diseases. It's it's just like a WHO. Okay, actually. infection disease prevention. Yeah, prevention. Yes. So it's a uh, I forgot the mnemonic name, but CDC is the main main organization which is which 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 is actually providing you guidelines for treating this one. So it's a central disease control something like this. Okay. Let, let me show you the second one. Why have forgotten? It's a very common thing. Yeah, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Okay. Let's go back at the question. Here the question is saying a 2-year-old girl with a high relapsing fever of 9 day duration associated with marked irritability a non purulent conjunctivitis is there and fever is there red cracked lips so see look look for the symptoms swollen and erythematous hands and feet so desquamation of the hands and feet and the maculopapular erythematous rash on the trunk and extremities so can you recall all these symptoms and from the disease that maculopapular rashes on the trunk this especially the hands and feet swollen conjunctivitis is there fever history is there so which of the following is the most likely like so especially the age of the child 2 years old so So, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Do you think it's Epstein-Barr virus infection? Do you think it's a Kawasaki rubella infection, measles? Of course, uh, Epstein-Barr virus infection, EBV, Cytomegaly virus infection. Most of the time, you will see diarrhea, uh, and it's mostly associated with overall gastrointestinal symptoms. It has nothing to do with this whole hands and feet involvement and conjunctivitis and all that. So, it's uh, of course excluded. Rubella infection. 
rubella infection, rubeola infection, there must be rashes, history, presentation should be there. And the, the, especially neonatal involvement is there. But, but again, uh, the child of the age of the child here is two years. So it's beyond neonatal time period. We will not think about rubella infection. Measles also again presenting with the pop-like spots and all that, you know, rashes all over the body. So, so it's not going, you know, uh, the symptoms are not exactly suggestive for all these things. Symptoms are very quite suggestive of Kawasaki disease based on based on this presentation of conjunctivitis, swollen hands and feet, erythematous rash, history of fever, especially age of the child, cracked lips. So all these symptoms are pointing towards making a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. The next one, we'll go for the theory first. Varicella infection. Varicella infection, again, it's not very much in data, but I wanted to show you in uh, MTB. So let me... So varicella, varicella, varicella here. So varicella infection is caused by varicella zooster virus. The name of the virus is varicella zooster. Multiple highly prurotic rashes you are going to see, especially on the face and possibly associated with fever. So for the involvement can be all over the body. You cannot differentiate. You cannot say it's only on the hands or trunk or, or on the face. It can be anywhere, but started on the face and possibly everywhere. So best initial test, you should know for the exam point of view, Zank smear, we usually perform showing multinucleated giant cell. Most accurate test is viral culture. Of course, it's a virus, can be excluded on viral culture, but the best initial for varicella, always remember it's a Zank smear, and it's going to show you multinucleated giant cell that will help you making a diagnosis. Supportive treatment you will give, of course, the virus, viral, uh, uh, we will give supportive ointment, viral anti ointments, antiviral ointments we can give, which can be applied all over the body just in order to prevent this. Pruritic pruritus, just in order to prevent itching. So, here also I wanted to show you an ambus. So, another name for varicella, of course, is the chicken box. The most important thing is clinical feature. You should know the incubation time period, but it's okay if you won't be able to memorize this one. So widespread rash starting on the trunk. So it will start on the trunk and then it will spread, spread to the face, scalp, and extremities. So we should know that whole all over the body is going to be involved. And simultaneous occur of various stages of rash. You can see macules can be there, papules and vesicles. So these are all the stages of rashes. First, it's just a macule. It's just, you know, you will see just one red flake. And then red flake is going to be, you know, uh, up from the body. And you can easily palpate them. And then that's a papule. And then it's going to become a whole fully rounded vesicle, uh, easily appreciable. And the clear fluid is inside. You can say vesicle. So these are called stages of rashes. It can be a macule. Then it becomes papule. And then it becomes vesicle. It has clear fluid inside. When you pop it, you can easily see a clear fluid is draining. Associated with severe itching. Severe itching is a clear, you know, symptom here. Fever, headache, and muscle joint pain. So, but the baby, they cannot, you know, uh, tell you about the headache and joint pain. But you can easily appreciate if it's in, in the older ages. But most of the time, it involves the children less than five years of age. So how you're going to diagnose these children? Clinical diagnosis made on the basis of rash. You will see the pattern of the rash, ask from the mother, or if the patient is immunocompromised, older or pregnancy, you know, in pregnancy also it can happen. So best initial test, Zank smear. We have already done some viral testing, viral culture, PCR testing will be the most accurate test, of course. And uh, see, these are the best symptomatic tests is PCR or viral culture. Now, viral culture, there's a difference between PCR, right? So PCR is here, it's a, they have mentioned best confirmatory test, PCR. In MTB is mentioned best confirmatory test is viral culture. So go for the MTB. I will not ask you to go for the AMBUS for this point. If, it, if they are going to ask you, uh, anyhow, they will not ask you for the most accurate one because Zank smear is the usually common one which we usually offer. And on the basis of Zank smear, we can easily diagnose it's a very silly infection. No need even for the go for the PCR. That's again expensive as well. But if they are asking, we can we can think about PCR. But in between, we have viral cultures also. So Zank smear, viral cultures, and then PCR. Treatment part, what you're going to give to these patients, of course, a symptomatic treatment for pruritus, we can give calamine lotion, oral antihistamine, we can give, and once it comes to antiviral, so antiviral is indicated only in immunocompromised individuals, those who have immunodeficiencies, where we can give primary infection or unvaccinated adolescents. So if the baby is more than, or the one who is more than 13 years of age, 
and uh, he's having this infection and he you know he has no history of previous vaccination or varicella vaccination then we can go for antivirals otherwise if it's vaccinated no need individual on long term salicylic therapy like the, the for the long term the patient is using aspirin it's, it's more less likely of course but if it's there we can give antiviral to these patient so administration within 24 hours of onset of rash so once the rash is appear so within 24 hours if you go for this uh, treatment of antiviral it's going to be of course effective drug of choice is aciclovir that's a common antiviral we are using for everything so what complication we can see in this can we can see impetizer or this this necrotizing fasciitis but of course this necrotizing fasciitis cannot occur in a day or two it will take time so that's why it's, it's coming under the heading of complication it will take some time to happen scarring can be there scarring is a most common complication cns can be involved acute cerebral ataxia less likely only 1% of cases we can see but but it can be there encephalitis can be there because of this infection so brain involvement is there lungs can also be involved causing pneumonia and if we are considering fetus if the mother is pregnant and having this varicella infection they are more likely to uh, you know giving birth to a baby who have congenital varicella syndrome so that's important in congenital varicella syndrome we have this uh, neonatal syndrome occurring with the same features but there are associated features as well like limb atrophy is there ocular defects is there baby is having cataract congenital cataract baby is having chorio uh, chorio retinitis so there are multiple syndrome involvement can be there but of course it's very specific to the mother who is pregnant and during pregnancy if she catches varicella infection then it's most likely that that this uh, the mother can uh, transmit this congenital varicella syndrome to baby so let's have a look at the questions first you are saying which of the following is the best initial test for diagnosing varicella infection best initial best initial is always zank smear and if they are asking you the most accurate one then it should be a pcr or viral culture so think uh, just look at the question if it's viral culture or pcr aspirin tb is viral culture so it's okay go for the viral culture but uh, but most accurate of course of course from from pcr onward is not anything so pcr should be the most accurate one as compared to viral cultures but we can go for the viral culture as well okay for this question a one year old boy is brought to the clinic for failure to thrive recurrent oral thrush tobacco spleen the megaly whenever it says failure to thrive always think about immunodeficiency any kind of immunodeficiency will be there so failure to thrive recurrent oral thrush is there tobacco spleen the megaly is there he had a brother who died at the age of 3 years with severe infection in septic shock so he has a family history so most likely it's a case of severe uh, severe uh, combined immunodeficiency where there, there is a involvement of brothers and sisters as well the whole family why because they are deficient of this b lymphocytes and t lymphocytes so severe immunodeficiency are there in their home which of the following vaccine must be avoided until a diagnosis is made so always always remember whenever there is immunodeficiency we will never give varicella vaccine so this one i will show you cdc guidelines so that you can have a better idea i open already open this guideline see these are the contraindications for varicella vaccination as per cdc those who are having history of anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis we will not give this var varicella vaccine to those those who are having any kind of blood disorders like uh, neoplasm lymphomas leukemias lymphatic system involvement bone marrow involvement like hepatosplenic megaly is there don't give varicella vaccine those who are immunodeficient either they are having hiv infection or they are having the severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome like the case mentioned in the question the baby is who is having failure to thrive the baby who is uh, uh, having this hepatosplenomegaly or oral candidiasis that's uh, that's showing the baby is having severe combined immunodeficiency we will never give varicella vaccine to those babies is receiving prolonged high dose systemic immunosuppressive therapy those who are on immunosuppressive agent therapy we will not give varicella vaccine to them has a moderate or severe concurrent illness say for example any kind of infection is running in the body don't give varicella vaccine has received blood products recently you know there is a history of any kind of blood transfusion don't give varicella vaccine has a family history like like the the in the case has mentioned that the brother also died because of sepsis so it means that some immunodeficiency is going on in the whole family don't give varicella vaccine so is is or maybe pregnant for more information so in pregnancy also we we don't give varicella vaccine so there are certain contraindication absolute contraindication where we don't give varicella vaccine so based on all these thing if we just look at the question again so he is having all the immunodeficiency 
symptoms plus he's also having a history of you know uh, this uh, brother who died at the age of 3 because of sepsis means severe immunocombined deficiency syndrome in the baby we will not get varicella vaccine so that's the only contraindication for varicella vaccine polio influenza and this pneumococcal conjugate we, we will usually get our most in influenza we don't have any any contraindication for this patient polio also injectable polio we can give polio vaccine there is no harm in giving polio vaccine and of course it's a one year old baby he must be receiving this one pneumococcal conjugate vaccine pneumococcal conjugate vaccine usually we prefer you know in in our old patient but of course those who have undergone or who are going to remove their spleen or uh, splenectomy is there because of any reason if you are planning or we will usually give this pneumococcal vaccine to us so there is no harm in giving this one as well there is no relation but it's good to give an immunocompromised patient mm -hmm. doctor is yes, there the uh, pneumococcal vaccine is given in the child uh, as we usually vaccine. give but but in, in old patient is highly recommended we do in the uh, uk is given Yeah, yeah, months and twelve months in like this. Mm -hmm. But here in DHA guidelines and also in our uh, you know uh, immunization guidelines uh, of Pakistan, we we usually don't prefer pneumococcal, but there is no harm. So those who are who are immunodeficient, actually, this pneumococcal is going to give benefit to those patients, and we always prefer before splenectomy we have to give this pneumococcal vaccination. Yes. Uh, we don't need to memorize. Uh, See, yeah, I I really recommend you if you are preparing for DHA exam, there is a complete DHA immunization guideline. If you don't have it, I will share it with you. Just memorize, you know, it's just same as a normal guideline. It's nothing changed there. Like uh, like a nine months, you are giving this MMR vaccine and like that. So you should know actually at which time period of no, age. No, no, you share with us that you have a class for memorization. Uh, you want those DHA that is available on Google also, but if you want, I can share with you the PDF of DHA immunization guideline. Just have a look at that. And uh, there's no need to memorize uh, incubation periods, huh? For DHA. The incubation for DHA, no. They never. I I have never seen for the last five six years any question related to incubation period. But there are lots of questions related to immunization contraindication, vaccination contraindication. Actually, like there we cannot get. Yeah, they usually ask these questions. Okay, you okay, better so have you better have a session for immunization. Okay, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Okay.